Welcome to V Brown Bag US. Today is Wednesday, August 19th, 2015. Tonight's topic is VCP, VMware Certified Professional, DCV, Data Center Virtualization, uh, VCP 6, Section 6, Backup and Recover vSphere Environments. Our guest presenter tonight is Ariel Sanchez. Ariel, uh, I am your co-host, Kyle Murley. Um, you can send your questions, comments uh, here through GoToMeeting, uh, raise your hand and I'm happy to unmute you and uh, pass the mic over there as long as you promise not to drop it. Um, also on the Twitters, uh, vbrownbag, of course, being the uh, hashtag, you can see uh, Ariel's uh, Twitter handle on there as well. Uh, quick notes before we dive in, uh, engage, get in the conversation. Uh, it's uh, at the brown bag, uh, if you're interested in the LATAM or EMEA, we are at the brown bag, L-A-T-A-M. That's usually uh, mostly in Spanish. Uh, and then of course we've got EMEA and uh, I don't know if this is still an April Fool's thing or not, but we got the V Brown Bag Jr. Uh, we've got the handle anyway. Uh, there's our hashtag. Uh, we do this crazy thing called uh, V Brown Bag, uh, professionalvmware.com. We do it uh, around the world, across the nation. Uh, as I stated, uh, tonight is uh, Ariel Sanchez and I am Kyle Murley. Uh, just a couple of uh, quick advertisements. Most of you who are on here know this, uh, but for the benefit of anyone new or anyone looking around and comes across this, uh, V Brown Bag is podcast. Look for us. Uh, you can find us on iTunes. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube if you just look around for, you guessed it, V Brown Bag. Uh, v Brown Bag is also at conferences. I said this is a little bit of a commercial, so I'm going to share with you. Uh, if you take a look on our website, professionalvmware.com, uh, check it out. We're going to be at VMworld uh, in San Francisco um, coming up in just uh, a few short days. I finally uh, did book my uh, flight there, so I know when I'm arriving and coming back. Uh, we've got the Tech Talk schedule posted there. Check it out. There's a whole bunch of really uh, cool, interesting topics uh, on there. Uh, we're going to be doing a couple of uh, panels as well. Um, not only um, the Tech Talks, but uh, together with uh, the cool dudes at uh, VM Underground, uh, we're going to be doing opening acts, uh, and that's kicking off on Sunday. So if you are in town, uh, definitely take a look. Uh, We've got VM Underground Party uh, as well, kicking off, and uh, the V Brown Bag Tech Talks live. Uh, those are going to be live in the hang space, and if you are not uh, at VM World, so you can't get into the hang space, uh, you can tune in live. Uh, we're going to have a live stream going, and that's on the, uh, the website there, V Brown Bags Live. Uh, that's it for commercials. Uh, while I pass uh, control over to Ariel, who is our presenter, um, I'll, I'll tell you a curious little story here. That'll hopefully give Ariel some time to get his uh, screen up there. Uh, Ariel is our guest presenter tonight, and uh, some of you probably know, uh, for the last two years, I've been hosting V Brown Bag Latam, uh, and we do that in Spanish every Thursday, so the, the, this week it's double duty for me. Um, Ariel's a regular contributor and a, and a, and a faithful attendee of the, the Latam Brown Bags, and uh, last week it happened, I was in New York, which is uh, where Ariel lives, and uh, he kindly opened his home uh, in Brooklyn up to me, and we uh, actually did the podcast uh, straight out of Brooklyn, uh, so that was very nice of him, and just a reminder that, uh, you know, we are a global community, and we do get together uh, offline, so, uh, you know, if uh, you're ever in a city where any of us are, uh, hit us up, let us know, and definitely look forward to seeing those of you who will be at VMworld uh, in just a few short days. And with that, uh, again, if you have a question, raise your hand. Happy to open the mic up for you or shoot it here in the question and answer or on the Twitters. Ariel, it's all you, buddy. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to apologize because there, um, this was a presentation that was done in very short order. Uh, it just so happened that, um, I, I don't know the story, but they basically offered who wants to do the Section 6 um, you know, basically they put it on Twitter this afternoon, and I said, well, you know, if nobody takes it, I could probably take it, thinking that today was Tuesday, and it turns out it was tonight, so I only, I only have like an hour to whip up the presentation. Even so, uh, and, and I think Kyle also went through the same thing, they asked who can present, and he was like, if nobody else presents, and here we are. Uh, remember, this is a community by us, for us, we are all friends here, so. Hopefully, I will give you enough so that when you're studying for the exam, you will um, know exactly where to focus your energy. And in and, and the worst case, if you only have an hour, this should be enough of a primer for you to get 
you know, a passable grade at least in this section. All right, so here's my information. I think I already put it this when I did the networking section. Uh, today there's no labs, boo, sorry, but I do promise I will put the videos uh, for basically the setup of the VDP device appliance and the and the v, uh, vSphere replication appliance. I will put them as soon as the video comes out. I'll put them in the comments. I'll also put them in my website, which is terrible, by the way. And uh, if I don't put them, you know where to find me and yell at me. All right. So let's talk about why we're why we're here tonight. It's objective six, well, section six, objective six point one. There's no other objective. It's just one objective, and it is to backup and recover a vSphere deployment. So today what we're basically going to go over our two technologies, uh, VMware Data Protection, which is um, an appliance that VMware gives you, it's including with the licensing, I think even with, um, with the essentials licensing. And um, it uses the same API that VM or Commvault or other um, more professional solutions or, or paid for solutions uh, actually use. It actually, I think it's a, it's a great deal. It, it includes, we're going to see it in a little while, but it does include some technology from EMC. So it's pretty sweet. And uh, we're also going to talk about the vSphere replication functionality, which is also, is, is also included in vSphere. Um, it is one of the building blocks of Site Recovery Manager, which is a solution that is licensed separately. It's basically what handles all the VM replications. And we're going to talk a little bit about, a little bit about it today. So those are the topics. This is the recommended material that the blueprint has up today states. So what I always like to do is, you know, some of these documents are very big, so at least I want to tell you what's the most important thing. So in the vSphere v data, you know, data protection overview, let me just get out of here and go to the, the actual site here. This one is a really small document around 13 pages. I do recommend you read it all. It's not very, you know, very long. It's a, it's a good overview and, and, and uh, explanation of what a device, a appliance does. Right? The next one is the administration guide. This one is quite obviously longer, but I do recommend for you to read chapters one and two, which basically talk about, again, with the what the solution is, but they also this is where you actually see the software requirements, system requirements, uh, some things about the configuration of the OVF that you're going to deploy, and best practices. The rest of it, you know, there's more operational things for when you actually are using it or if you're using the lab, but that's not exactly part of the blueprint. You're going to see this in a little bit, but we're basically looking at Requirements, guidelines, versions, describe the architecture on this for replication. So, uh, from the next document, this is an evaluation guide. I also recommend you read it all, especially if you didn't uh, have the time or take the time to actually install it and take a look at it. Go ahead and read it all. It basically tells you, okay, we have an environment. Where I think it uses like three hosts. Uh, you know, we put yeah, three to five virtual machines and basically tells you, okay, so you're doing this and then you're looking at here and then you're deploying and you get this icon. So if, if this, is, this is hopefully what I'll produce in a video later on saying, okay, this is how the VDP device is uh, deployed and installed and this is how you do things. But it is a good, you know, explanation and screenshot kind of place to take a look at. Um, finally, there is a what's new document, specifically pages 15 and 16. Talk about, let me go over here, talk about the VDP and these replication enhancements. Make sure you read that. It's nothing you didn't read in the other ones, but it's a good summary uh, about you know things you should know for the exam, definitely. And all of these were related to data protection, but uh, there's one document for research replication, which is the administration guide. It's 100 pages long, and honestly, you, you're going to read most of it. Uh, chapter 1, 3, 4, 7, 
can go to it and let me explain why. So we're looking at an overview. This one is not part of the blueprint. They, they don't really go into roles and permissions, but they do ask you requirements. Uh, how do you deploy these? How do you reconfigure the appliance, for example? It, it does have a V this year. Uh, appliance management interface, Avami, that you can do some things. Uh, and very particularly, uh, I put in there page 52, because they single out how to actually set up the, the certificates on it. So that is something you want to read. And um, I'm sorry about that. And basically, you know, how do you replicate a machine over? How do you do performer recovery and that? So that is one document that, although it's long, I do think you probably want to read it, most of it. Um, all right, so that's the recommended material that comes directly from the blueprint. Um, we're also going to take advantage, and, and this is the case today, as I obviously didn't have time to do a bunch of slides. We're going to go ahead and go to the ECP6 study guides that are available. And in this particular case, we're going to use uh, Bladen and Jason Langer's study guides, which are which were very complete. And uh, we'll just use them both at the same time. And if we find something that the other didn't have, we'll, we'll discuss it. Now, um, remember that V. Brownback, like Kyle has mentioned, it is available in several formats. I know that Jorge Cabrera has already done the one for Latin. Um, I don't think we have uploaded it yet, but as soon as we upload it, you'll be able to see it. And you know, maybe you don't speak much Spanish, but you can see the slides, and you can maybe he did. He may have done a a lab. I really don't know. Sorry. Uh, so other awesome material, obviously the, the mastering the sphere book. I don't think I haven't even seen announced what the date is for the official VCP6 book, but when it comes out, you probably want to see it. And uh, Jason Langer actually put some KBs to talk about snapshots. Those are some of the things that you can take a look at as well. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and dig in. And let's start talking about each um, each one of the objectives. So like I said, we're going to go over Latin's and Jason Langer's um, blogs. And you know, this is just like, we're friends, we're buddies. I, I actually expect you to do your study, but I will go over the most important parts. And if anybody has any question, anybody wants to contribute something, just let Kyle know. Everybody can talk here. All right, so snapshot requirements. Um, one thing that you want to know with snapshots, it's um, I mean, actually I'm, I'm looking at this, and there's there's some great things. But let me see if Jason actually put some different things in here. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what a VMware snapshot is, first of all. So this is a point in time. Um, you, you remember that all VM, VMs are, are actually just files in the data store. So when you decide to take a snapshot, what you're doing is you're freezing the VM disks at that moment, and your VM basically goes into, you know, in, inside quotes, logging mode, where it's actually just logging every change of, of everything the VM is doing, and this allows you the ability to tell, you know, the interface, hey, I want to go back to when we froze the disk, you know, get rid of all that log that you created, or go ahead and merge that log into the VM and let's continue as it was. Um, so that's, that's basically what a snapshot is. You can also not only make a snapshot of the VM disk, but you can also make a snapshot or, you know, take a, like a, an image, let's say that way, of the v virtual machine's memory. Um, you can actually, you know, there's, um, I think I can actually show that in the lab. I said no lab, but as a snapshot we can do really fast. You can actually tell it, um, yeah, let me bring, go ahead and bring it. So this is good old lab. Uh, let's talk about where you do the snapshots. Snaps snapshots are something that you do directly on the VM. So you get this option here if you're doing it in the web client. Again, you just right click the VM and you go to snapshots. And you can 
either take a snapshot or manage the snapshots, right? In this case, I had already done a snapshot of this particular VM, so this is what, what I call my old snapshot. It was done, you know, maybe an hour ago. Won't do anything to it yet. Uh, this machine does not have any snapshots yet, so let's go ahead and take a look here. So you can just decide to take a snapshot, or you can go into this management interface, and you can look at what's in there right now. So one cool thing, it tells you what the disk usage is now on the web client, which I don't think it does on the old, uh, yeah, it doesn't do that on the old C client. So that's a good thing, because remember, since this is something that once you enable it, it basically doesn't stop growing. It's a log. So the, the main thing to remember with snapshots is these are not a backup. These are just a thing where you can actually go back and point in time. But if you leave snapshots <laughs> in there, they will fill up your data store eventually. So they're not a good thing to leave there. They're just a good thing to, well, you know, let me do this change, which I think could mess up the OS to the point that it will be very difficult to go back in time, you know, and if I had to revert the change manually, but with the snapshot, it's just a click. So you just take a click, uh, take snapshot, you put a name on it, you say whatever, and if you see here where it says you have that option that I was talking about that you, you can snapshot the virtual machine's memory as well. So when would you do this? When you do this, you are going to come back to a fully running machine and there you go, the machine goes back to that point in time even when it was running. If you don't snapshot the virtual machine's memory and you just decide to go back, uh, you probably, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that you, you go back to a machine that's turned off and then you turn it on and it says, hold on, who who shut me off here? You want me to go into recovery? And you tell it now just boot normally and it comes back up. So you have that option there. Um, I'll come back to the lab in a bit, but here we were talking about what we can do with the snapshot. Uh, so remember, since the full VM, all of the VM is part, is just files, you're, you're saving you know, the settings in the machine, the configuration, the hardware configuration. Uh, there are some things that get enabled when you have better, um, when you have a, 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 a higher version of the VM hardware. We'll talk about those in a bit. Uh, another thing is if you want to do the memory, if you want to, there's there's another function called keyessing where it actually stops the I/O on the machine before it takes the snapshot for a little while. You know uh, that those two things require VMware tools to be installed. So just remember that. And uh, here's where the where Jason put the the KB articles. Uh, so let me go back to Vlad and slog here and. <laughs> yeah, this, for example, change block tracking. This is a a function that VMware offers for backups. Where it oh, let let me talk about that then. Most of the applications, VMware data protection included, that backup a VM, they do so by taking a snapshot. So they take a snapshot of the VM, grab the files that were frozen, copy them over, and then release or delete or merge that snapshot back into the VM, and up it goes, right? And they do this every night. Of course, if you did a, a full every night, you'd be, you know, it's probably the best thing in the world, but it's a lot of data, a lot of copying. Uh, VMware starting with, I'm pretty sure it was hardware version 7, um, basically gives the interface to these programs it gives them the ability to know exactly which um, blocks of the VMs have changed since the last time they took this snapshot. So you basically get only a differential uh, backup for the following snapshots. But when the, when you actually do a restore, the software is smart enough to know, okay, so I have this, this pool that I took. I just do this differentials. Here you go. You have your full VM to that day. So that is one thing that you want to know with the snapshots that if you want to have change block tracking, it depends on a specific uh, VM hardware version. Let me see if there's anything else in here. Mm. When you look at this, I think this, the particular, the first one, 
it has a lot. Well, it has a nice video, right? But it also has the good explanation. What is a snapshot? How do you create it? What is key assing? What is the memory? Uh, oh, let's take a look at what when you actually create a snapshot. What happens to the to the to, that, to those files? Remember that I said they were frozen. Okay, so this is a normal VM. Uh, I have not taken the snapshot here, and you'll notice, especially if we're looking at the VMD case, which is the the hard disk of the machine, the VMware disks. You'll notice in, in this case it's a very simple machine. It only has one disk right here. Uh, you have other things. You have your swap. You have your RAM, etc. Your VMX configuration file. You have some logs. But this is what a machine looks like when you don't have a snapshot. Uh, when you do have a snapshot, go into the other one. You get some more files. All right. So you still have your VMDK, but this file is frozen. I don't know if I can show that with a timestamp or not. Maybe no. You start. What you get is another VMDK that has this little identifier. So whenever you see these files that have the same name of a VMDK and you have numerals, basically, your machine has snapshots. And you can see also this this is another one of those files. You know that metadata is stored in this VMSN. So knowing this is important. And actually, let's go ahead and, and do another snapshot in this machine because you can do more than one snapshot, right? So let's take another snapshot, another. Um, let's say I do all this. Well, maybe I don't, right? But you have those options there. I think you will get another file here to separate that uh, snapshot. Let me see if it's already done right now. So once it does it, we click refresh, and we should see something here. So that's a good indication. This is how you can really tell, hey, look, you know, it's not going to touch this disk, period. It's only going to touch those uh, differentials that it started creating. And those are the ones that actually start getting big, like really big. So here we see we have a new 002. Notice how this file had reached a certain you know, size. This is a file that this machine, I haven't even logged into it. It has been doing nothing but counting time. <laughs> but still, it has generated 50 megs in the last hour. So take that into account. Imagine if this was a real you know, a database or something. Um, one final thing with snapshots. OK, so this is all great and, and good. But what happens when you want to do something about it? Well, you come back to the snapshot manager. Um, two things, and you read this. You'll read this in the fact. When you want to delete, um, let, me, let me say this right. If you select the latest snapshot and click delete all, all changes will be merged, and the machine will continue as it is. If you want to go to a previous snapshot, let's say I took a snapshot here, but I messed things up. I want to go to this one. Then I actually think you, yeah, you click on the one you want, and then you say you click go to. When you click go to. Notice that it says the current state of the virtual machine will be lost. What does that mean? That file. These files that we're seeing here, whether it contained data that you wanted for some reason, let's say this was a database, this is not a good idea, you will you are going to lose that data because what we're basically going to do is delete this file. So if I click on that, it says, yeah, oh, okay. Now, well, I think that that's when you click delete. Go to just takes you there, but I don't think it deletes it. No? Yep. Yeah. No? Yes. What is it, Larry? Major one. Okay, so I know one of the. Okay, I click close here. So yeah, you still have that file. I'm sorry there. It was delete instead of that one. Now notice there's a third file in here. Uh, that third file is basically. Well, I don't know what I'm talking about. The 002 did leave. Oh, so it did delete. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that, guys. 
I did create another file in there that you can go to still. This is another checkpoint, but it does apparently change the files. All right, so what if I don't want to go to, to this another one? Then you click delete. No, I'm messing this up. <laughs> that, that wasn't the right one. There's a, I'm, I'm probably going to have to look at the freaking pack because I don't really don't do this at all, but let me see. Show this, show this and she uses it. So while Larry was poking, poking at the docs there, I guess the, the lesson here in, in knowing the, the snapshots and, and confirming, you know, don't do not do this in production, right? Uh, so experiment around like, like yeah. Ariel's doing here. Take a look at the at where those deltas are. Um, understand what happens when you're going to either roll back or move to uh, versus delete. Exactly. Now, you know, I'm pretty sure I had read this once, and I, I thought to myself, I understand this. But it's a very common thing that people mess up. So I know if you want to merge anything, you can select the last one, click delete all. If you want to be in here, because I remember it deletes everything up. So if I took a snapshot and I click delete, it deletes everything up. Okay. So let me, let me I'm, I'm sorry to do this, but I'm just going to do another test to make sure I got it right. Take another snapshot. Call it whatever. Go back to the manager. So we will create a snapshot. What if I want to go here and delete everything else? Then you select that one. Okay, that's the one. So you select the one that you want and you click delete all. And that merges all the snapshots but gives you the the, cover, the point in time that you wanted. If you do what I did, what I did before, where I selected something and click delete, you delete that point in time. So for example, there's ASDF, right? This is the one I just created, and there's another. Well, if I want to merge every change, but up to here, I don't, I'm not, I don't care what happened from here on. You select that one, you click delete all. It will consolidate everything into that one that I said. Okay, sorry about that, guys. That's okay, Ariel. So we're we're all. More. Yeah, we wanna we wanna step through it uh, ourselves as well. <clears throat> uh, I've got a comment here from Graham. Graham, if you want me to open up your mic, uh, I'm happy to do that, or I can read out your comments. Nah, okay. So pass on on the mic. Uh, Graham was just noting uh, no mic. Okay, not that you don't want it. Uh, you ain't got one. Uh, you can also exclude disks from snapshot if you want to make them independent disks when you configure yep. your VM hardware. So that, that's something important to kind of understand. Um, a use case that, that Graham mentions is for Windows domain controllers uh, to keep uh, NTFS on an independent disk. Thanks, yep. Graham. So what, what Graham is mentioning is you select the, v, the virtual disk here, and you make it here independent. And you see here independent disks are not affected by snapshots. You basically can't snapshot them. Um, one of the cool things, also, if you have like a lab, uh, I know Josh um, Andrews uses this a lot. If you make them non-persistent, that means that whatever happens to the machine while it's running, once you reboot it, it's gone. So it's a cool thing to, you know, if you set up a lab that people log into, they do stuff, and you need the lab to be going back to where it was instead of doing snapshots, you can just make them non-persistent disks and just a reboot clears them up to the to the moment where they were before. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't know if you know Andrew. There's a lesson. Oh, sorry. I don't know if you know uh, Ariel. Just Andrews is on. He, he just said, yeah, non non-persistent rules. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there he goes. I, I just remember it from the from the time that he was explaining his lab. Yeah. All right. So. Let's move on. I want. I really want to be done in an hour today, so we have half an hour. So we're going to identify the VMware data protection requirements, sizing guidelines, and version offerings. Okay. So requirements. Mm, these are more like features in here. Let me see. It's, here we go. The requirements are here. You actually need. Even though the minimum is 5.1, you want 5.5, preferably 6.0. Um, it does support the VCSA as well as the Windows Server. Web browsers must have 
and normally I use Chrome, but if you're using IE, for example, make sure you have Adobe Flash Player uh, for some of the UI requirements that you'll have in there. You want to deploy this on VMS 5 or later data stores. I only seen like 554, 556. Uh, but basically you're saying use the VMS 5 that has a 1 meg instead of an upgraded VMS 3, which may have a different block size. Uh, okay, so here's what we were say, uh, speaking about before. Uh, CBT requires hardware version 7. You do want CBT, and you want to have VMware tools running. Um, we talked a little bit about this, but one important thing is unsupported virtual machine disk types. Most of the time, you want to have VMDKs. Uh, you don't want to have independent disks because of you know they don't support snapshots, and you also don't want to have RDMs. Um, even though RDMs now in version 6 are actually a bit more, you know, they have more support, you still can't, you know, use them for some things such as this. Uh, system requirements for VDP, it's basically the same um, appliance in the sense that you get uh, four cores, but memory does increase if you start using it a bit uh, in the bigger you get you get you get an option when you deploy the OVF. Okay, how big do you want to make this device? And you get from half a terabyte to eight terabytes. So this is the actual required space that you need. Uh, so if you want to back one terabyte worth of actually the duplicated data, which is a bunch of VMs, you do need the the that appliance to sit on 1.6 terabytes. Now let's talk about sizing. This is a cool thing. This is a very askable question in the exam. How many BDP appliances can you have per vCenter? The answer is 20, which is actually quite a lot when you consider 28 terabyte devices. Uh, but we're going to see some things about that as well that may change that. Um, supposedly you can do up to 400 virtual machines. What really defines this is the, the storage amount. Uh, so how many virtual machines and the data set size is what really defines how many you can fit into one appliance. Um, you do define your backup data retention periods and stuff. Let me see if I put something else in here. Mm, let's talk about features, a little bit of the features before I move on from here. Um, remember that VDP basically takes snapshots. So when you take a snapshot, you have a full image level backup of your VM. It's not like you have to rebuild the OS and then restore data. No, you restore and your VM is good to go. Um, there's also, and this was very interesting to me, there's also support for some guest level backup. Uh, it's not like you can install, um, you know, just a file agent like Semantic Backup or Combo to Arx or, you know, agent and, and backup files. They're only for SQL, uh, Exchange, and PowerPoint. But you can actually install these agents. These are actually agents, where, whereas the VM backup is agentless. Uh, you can actually install these on physical servers. And um, it does support all the granular resource that are normally associated with Exchange and SQL Server. So that's a pretty cool feature. And um, it does, uh, when you have a VM backed up, notice, uh, when, when you have a VM, it does support file level restore. Okay, here it is. Uh, granular file level restores. Let's say that you want you don't want to do a restore of the whole backup uh, VM. You know, just because you need some files, you can actually tell it, okay, now just browse in here and we're gonna restore some files into this backup. Um, all right. So let me see if I can get something out of more out of this. Talked a bit about the. This is the, what comes in the guide. So, Ariel, we, we've got a question on sizing, and I see that uh, in that in that table there. Sure. Um, it, it's a great question, and one that uh, you know, will probably come up at some point. Is uh, is there, and this is open to everybody and anybody on the call, is there an easy-ish way to work out what size your change set is going to be? Um, so basically saying, you know, what, what's your, your rate of change and, and how, you know, how quickly are things going to change um, so that you know you, you can figure out capacity wise what you're going to need. Does that make sense? I would totally mm, botch that question. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Sorry, um, Grant. To be quite honest with you, 
I think you have to at least try it out. And, and I'm just highlighting this because because and my answer is going to basically hinge on this comment. Since this is an appliance that deduplicates data, um, if you just do hard numbers, you might um, end up saying, okay, I need three appliances, and then you realize that hmm, maybe I just needed one. And that's because of the deduplication. Uh, remember that, let's say you're backing up one single image of Windows 2012. Even though in paper it's, I don't know, you know, 10, 100 gig disks, at some point this device will learn that, you know, all these files are pretty much the same, so I'm just going to keep one copy of those. And instead of spending one terabyte, I'm just going to use, let's say, 150. So normally if you would just do the, the numbers, you would say, oh, it's this much and this much and this much, and I have, I'm doing the differential and the backup and this and that. But since you also have to take into account that the device does the duplication, I would say, you know what, run a test set. Definitely start with the normal things that you normally would do, you know, okay, this amount of data, this amount of change, you know, monthly backup, et cetera, et cetera, do your calculations. But then remember that you have the duplication in the back. It's probably going to come to less as time passes. Thanks, Ariel. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, probably someone already asked this question somewhere. Let me see. If, uh, it may be here in the guide saying, you know, how to calculate. Let's see, the storage capacity. There may be some more information in here. So there, there's a note in the KB, it, <laughs> and basically it yeah, says, it's, uh, it's, if, if you're not sure, deploy a larger VDP, because once it's been deployed, you can't add capacity. And I don't know if that continues to be true in the latest version. I, I thought that the latest version of VDP mm -hmm. or VDP-A, yeah. you could uh, add the additional capacity, but I could be mistaken on that. Well. That's actually a good question. I didn't think to check them on that. Anybody on the call now? Modify configuration settings. You would think that somewhere it says creating new storage, disk expansion. OK, this looks promising. <laughs> I like your comment, Adam. <laughs> I'm not going to read it out, but it's true. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so yeah, with, with VDP Advanced, uh, you could expand your destination data store. Oh, that's, that's important. Then I forgot to mention that. I think I haven't gotten there yet. But an important thing is that now in Visphere 6, it's only one version. It's ba they basically grabbed the Advanced, which was a pay for product before, and they made that the default. So you do get the Advanced, let's say that way. There's no longer a, a separate Advanced. That was the next bullet point that we were going to talk about. Um, so from what I'm looking here, it does have some expansion requirements and what to do with the heap size and how do you do the, the disk expansion. So it does look like you can expand the device in version 6 or, you know, or just because it's the advanced version now that is the default. All right. Um, so we already covered this the technical overview that we're talking about. Let's see where we are. We basically just covered this part. Let's go ahead and talk about vSphere replication. Dun, dun. We're going to talk about this. Perfect. All right. So vSphere replication, separate product. What does it do? It just allows you to uh, basically say, I'm going to create another copy of this VM somewhere else. Where is this somewhere else? Uh, basically, you get a, b a bunch of options about where you're going to do it. So you can do from a source site to a target site. Notice there's two different vCenter servers. This is like the classic example. Use a log with SRM, for example. Um, SRM, if you if you haven't ever done it, it it uses the uh, vSphere replication, but it does handle um, the scheduling and it handles the IP address changes if you need to, if, if you have different networks in the source and target site. So it builds on vSphere replication. But this is the, basically the, 
the, the base case where you deploy, uh, re-realize appliances, and these guys say, okay, let me talk here, and, and that VM, I'm going to go ahead and move it over to that site. You can also do it within a single site from one cluster to another. So this is a handy thing if you, you know, you want to keep another backup for some reason. And you can, one, another one of the, of the very cool ones in, in the case where people have remote offices and, you know, you don't have, let's say, a good backup infrastructure at your remote office, well, you can actually schedule a, a, a replication from all your source sites and go ahead and put them in the data center, for example, at the target site. Let me see where I'm putting anything else in here. Um, single v center. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so those are basically the replication architectures, single site, remote and source, source and remote site, source and target site, and several sources to one target. So we already <laughs> we already went over to create, delete, and consolidate virtual snapshots. I want to talk about that consolidate feature. Let's say because God is great and good, um, you find out that you have one of your machines has a bunch of snapshot files, but when you go in and click on it, it actually doesn't show snapshots. Hmm. Well, in this case, I think it's just a refresh that I need, but let's say that that happens to you. What you can do is, uh, and this used to be a command that you had to do in the command line, but ever since version 5.0, you have the consolidate option. So it goes in and checks all the redo logs. I'm not sure if it's these ones or not. Let's see if anything goes away. You know. So anything that you basically identify that, oh, look at that, that's a broken snapshot, those con a consolidate function will actually clean up for you. And that's important because sometimes you don't understand why a machine that you granted a certain amount of storage is taking more storage than that. It's a broken snapshot. You know, one of the backup programs for some reason had an error. It didn't go ahead and clean up after itself. So that's how you manage to clean up those files. In, in my particular experience, I've also had where you have some of those files in there, and a consolidate doesn't really get rid of them. But if you do a storage B motion on that VM and move it somewhere else, then everything that the VM needed moves with the VM, and everything that, that it didn't need stays on the previous folder. And those are safe to delete. So that's a little tip there. Um, you know, the, the vSphere 6 exam is mostly uh, multiple choice, so you don't need to know this. But like you saw, even I messed it up, and I thought I understood them well. So make sure you understand um, when when the delete button is cor the correct option, right? All right. So install and configure VMware data protection. Um, it is an OVF template. You have to specify the name of the machine, the DNS settings, the manual IP address. You get the VAMI, the vSphere Appliance Management Interface, to finish some of the things. But it's very much the same as every other appliance, like VMware appliance that you have deployed. Uh, let me see if we get some more. Yeah, so after the deployment starts, there's a default account that you can you log into and you finish this wizard in order to, you know, connect to the vCenter and stuff like this. Uh, important thing, when you are doing the storage, if your storage is separate from where your VM is residing, you can select that differently, but or, or if you already put it where you think, you can just store with the appliance. So once you actually install it, you will see an icon in your web client. Uh, notice that, you know, in this year six, nobody talks about the C client anymore. So this is something that you will do through the web client. All right, let's talk about creating a backup job. And, um, you know, it goes like from one to the other, but it's basically only these two solutions that we're talking about. So creating a backup job, you go into that icon, you tell I want to create a backup job. You tell it, well, you want to do a virtual machine or you want to do an application. This is where you, you would do the SQL, the exchange. Do you want to do a full image or do you want to just select some disks? So you have that flexibility. You can tell it, you know, I, I don't really care in this machine. I only care about this particular drive where I keep my web application files, for example. 
that's what I want backed up, you can do that. You select the backup schedule and a retention policy, you call it something, and then you basically tell it, I think it's around here, where you tell it what times you want this to run. So by default it comes at 8 p.m. So this is something that I will definitely put in the, in the video. Now let's talk about reshare replication. You'll find that it's not very different. Um, it's just the same appliance kind of thing that you're going to do. Let's see if we actually have one here. Yeah. Uh, Latin apparently already ran into those problems where you don't have the fully qualified domain put correctly. Make sure your fully qualified domain names are done all right. But then you get an OVF template, you put in a fixed IP. Uh, one nice thing about this one is you still get a, a VAMI, which is one of the things I'm missing in the in the version 6 uh, VCSA. Hey Amen. All right, so you should see the VR plugin, which is this one. Um, in one of these, I think I read somewhere, make sure you log off and log back on, because if not, you're not going to see it. I think it was either that one or this one. I think Bladen said, yeah. So when you do the VDP device, it can take a while to reboot, log off and log on. It won't appear until it does. OK. So this is a, a very particular one that they just said, like, you have to know how to do this. How do you configure your certificate of authority, your VMCA? In this case, it's very, very you know, this is a, a version 6 thing with VC replication. So this is done through the VAMI. And let me go here. Uh, so how do you change the SSL certificate on the replication appliance? So basically, they tell you, and I'm going to go back to, to the ones with the screenshots, but you basically go through the VAMI, 450, 480, and you, you do the selections in there. It does have a verification. Uh, it does have requirements. Uh, for being able to put that certificate in there. So let me go back here. Let's see if Lennon or Jason actually had one of those. All right. You can change the certificate. You log into the LAMI. You go in there, and in here, you tell it install a new SSL certificate. Uh, in this case, I'm not sure if this is the VMCA. It does look to it like that. Let me see if Jason put something in there. No, I think he just. Oh, here it is. So he basically put the steps in here, and said, you know, put that in there. Um, that's that's an interesting one because they're very specific about it being the the certificate of authority. So I'll have to take a look at that one when I do my, my video. All right. So now let's talk about how do you configure that replication. So basically, in the replication, you right-click the VM, and you tell it, hey, I want to talk to you about this year replication. Uh, but put this note here, very funny, where he's saying, hey, after you deploy this thing, you, you want to have restarted the vCenter service. Uh, if you don't, if you have not restarted, you will not see this. It, it, once you restart it, you see it here. And so that's from the field experience. So he ran into this. Uh, once you select the you know, replication actions, configure replication, um, you want, you already have deployed the vSphere replication appliance. So you may have more than one. You may want to select which one you're going to use. There are some things, other things that we're going to go over why why you would want to have several or not, and you have to select exactly okay where's where's your target VM location. So, in this case, I think that he just made it into a another data store and the same cluster and the same data center. Uh, notice the edit button here. This is where you would normally enable compression. No, I don't, that's not true. This is where you change where you want to replicate it. Compression is in the next one. Okay. Uh, and we're going to talk about the compression a little bit 
because I think it's one of the features now. Okay, select a single or multiple virtual machines. Select the target replication site or data store. And you, you, you'll find that you're going to choose a data store, but you have to select one of the options. Okay, you're going to do a remote place. Um, and then you select recovery point objective. Recovery point objective that basically tells when you're when you're defining recovery, right? You say, I want to be able to restore this machine to the last backup. Let's say that. let's say that's your recovery point objective. Okay, perfect. You only need to sync that machine once a day. What happens if you have some kind of requirement to be able to provide the last hour, let's say, you know, the last, you know, and this is mostly a business decision where people have to determine how much are they willing to pay to have that, you know, that sync from one side to another to be almost instantaneous. Uh, there are some solutions in the market that do instantaneous, you know, sync replication. I've never worked with any of them, but I know for for this year application, I think the minimum that you can do is 15 minutes, and you can see it here in this slider. So what you're basically saying here is, if I lose my original VM, my source VM, I am doing a schedule here where I'm replicating the changes between my source and my target every 15 minutes. And if I lose that machine, I only lost 15 minutes worth of data. Uh, let's say that you have a your Amazon, and uh, this is not a good example, but let's say that you're Amazon and you say, you know, 15 minutes worth of orders, I can deal with that, customer service can deal with that, that's okay. Uh, if you need less than that, you probably have to go pay for something. But most times, you know, you don't really need 15 minutes of, of the last data if you're talking about maybe file server. People that just uploaded the file to the file server probably still have it. So 15 minutes worth of work is probably something good. It may be two hours, it may be three hours, you know. So this is where you basically take the, that business feedback and implement it into how how much data will I lose in the event of a disaster, and I actually have to start using my replicated copy as my primary, right? Um, there's also an option here, which is pretty cool, which is point-in-time instances. So you can see that they are basically uses that snapshot technology and you can keep uh, you can decide to keep point in time instances of that machine as well so you're not only replicating the latest um, changes of that machine you also have options on your replicated place over well you know what let's say that I got my latest version, but that latest version we had already been hacked at that moment. Uh, let's go ahead and deploy instead of that version, the version one, a version that was one day before, which we know we were hacked by then. Let's say that's an example. So you get that flexibility with uh, this sure application. Um, let's talk about compression methods. And this is something that I want to talk about. So. It says they depend on the version of ESXi and VR, uh, but basically it, it is something that you want to have 6.0 across the board to have. Let me see if I have it here. Okay, so compression methods. Earlier than 6.0 for the source, no compression. 6.0 for the source, earlier than 6.0, it sends compressed data. The target can decompress the data, and if six are available for a target data store, the application server uses the resources to decompress the data. Okay, so you basically can send the data over there, but you will lose something here. When you're doing 6.0 to 6.0, you have full end-to-end -end compression. Why is this cool? Well, you are you know, basically sending a bunch of data across who who knows what links, right? If you're doing local, you probably don't care much, but if you're doing remote, uh, remote office, for example, then you want to know that you're doing uh, the, the best compression that you can. 
And one thing that I want to check in here is exactly what that compression is, because I don't think I read about that. Here we go. That's all I'm looking at. So I, it doesn't really mention what the compression algorithm is or what the rate of compression is at this, at least from where I'm looking. It just says, you know, we're doing an algorithm here that will actually um, make the bandwidth that you need a bit less. There is a, a an important thing to know about data compression, and even I think Vladim put it here. If the target host is earlier than 6.0, replication with compression enabled prevents the motion from moving replication source VMs to the host. It does not support data compression. So this actually prevents DRS. If you need to move a replication source VM to an ESX size host earlier than 6.0, before you perform the motion, you know, disable data compression. Otherwise, the errors get disabled. So that's an important thing to know. It does have that advantage of, the being, of you being able to move those VMs around. If, I, if, if this was me, to be honest, I would do this on a native 6.0 environment and not have to figure those things the hard way. All right. So we're, we're at the top of the hour, but we still have a bit more things to go. So how do you recover that? Uh, you basically come in and you select inside VC replication. You go to monitor, to incoming replications. You select the machine, and you click on start recovery. You have two options. Recover uh, the latest available data. And um, it does not perform a synchronization. It basically just says, OK, well, let me go ahead and do this. Or it recovers with recent changes, meaning that if I have some data already available, I'm just going to sync it to the latest and then do this. It's obviously going to be um, faster, but only if it's powered off on the on the place that you're trying to recover. Um, let's see, the next one says perform a failback operation. What is a failback? Well, you basically had a source to a target and you said, let me test this out. So you move your primary, your, your active machine is actually not in your source anymore. It's in your target. You want to roll this back. That is a failback. When you go back to the way that, you know, in a, in a two replication scenario, um, you're going back to the way that things were. So if I'm not mistaken, you manually configure a new replication in the reverse direction. And the disks that are there are used as replication seeds, so it's only it's a quick thing because it only synchronizes the changes. Uh, important thing, you must unregister that virtual machine from the inventory on the source site. OK, and lastly, so let's determine your appropriate backup solution for a given vSphere implementation. Well, the, the real answer, it depends. It depends on your needs. It depends on your budget. It depends on um, your business objectives, ultimately. So I think I think both of them will go back to this question and say, you know, you, ha you really have to weigh it out. Let's see, yeah, it's not even in this part. So this is one where place where you can say, hey, you know what, the MVP works, uh, VDP works fine for me, and that's all I need. Perfect, no power to you. Uh, if you need to, because of compliance or some policy in your IT organization, that your backups cannot be in the same place as the, as the thing that you're trying to back up. So you're, you know, people will come to you and say, so let me get this straight. If your VMware environment goes, our backups go to OA2, you know, that kind of thing, this may not be the solution for you. So it really is a, an it depends kind of situation where you really have to take into account what the business needs and also what the business expects, especially important when you're configuring, uh, defining RPO, RTO, and um, what was the other one? There's recovery point objective, recovery time objective, and there, there was the, uh, there's another one that they, that they put in the DCD that I think it was, 
Man. That's what Google is for. Hold on. RPO, RTO, and no, no, these are the ones that I mean. ECAP, ECB. There you go. This is a, a nice, a nice post. Da, da. Re work recovery time, which is okay. So here, here's where we define recovery point objective and maximum total value. Okay. So we have a disaster. We have some time to reco to to bring this back, but. Uh, you know, from bringing it back to the actual point where, where production is back, it's called the mean time, maximum tolerable downtime. So you have to know these things when you're planning out what your backups are going to be. And actually, this is a good link. I'll tweet it out later. And Kyle, I'm sorry because, you know, some things really felt rushed and some things, you know, especially, I, I'm really sorry about this, that snapshot there. No, man, it wouldn't be a brown bag if uh, we didn't kind of make it up uh, as we go. That's that's part of this, man. We're all we're all here studying oh, together, oh. trying to learn. So I just remember. Here you go. The host has a bag of tomatoes if you need them. There we I go. Can't expect that something to happen. V, v tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> they're in they're, they're in the V brown bag. Uh, so if you, anybody wants to throw a tomato at uh, Ariel, uh, that's perfectly legit. Just hashtag B brown bag on the Twitters everybody fall asleep or are we are we still out there anybody got any questions comments nuggets of knowledge uh, additional resources that uh, maybe others viewing the recording uh, or attending uh, right now uh, probably want to hang on to feel free to raise your hand uh, shoot them out on the chat we'll get those babies into the recording and uh, make sure if we're able to uh, put them in the blog post as well go on once Bueller, Bueller, Ariel, you have wowed us all. Uh, thank you very yeah. much. That's that's normally that's normally the opposite, actually. When, when nobody has questions, like I have nothing to learn from this guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's never true. Can always learn something. Everybody. Excellent. Well, then, uh, as Ariel pours himself a, a cool glass of hopefully something not uh, not water, some uh, V Brown Bag appropriate uh, drink there. Um, put one last call out here. Don't see anything on the Twitters. So this has been uh, Objective Six for the VCP DCV, and your presenter tonight has been uh, Ariel Antigua. This is your co-host Kyle Murley. Check us out on professionalvmware.com. Search out for V Brown Bags and uh, two final announcements. Uh, one, uh, V Brown Bag Latam happening in Espanol every Thursday night, and uh, V Brown Bag Tech Talks Live happening at VMworld and streaming live from our website, professionalvmware.com. With that, I'm gonna end the recording. Uh Kyle, Go ahead, Ariel. one last thing. Please. You said Ariel Antigua, and he's probably going to get mad at, at <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> we have two Ariels that are, are regulars on uh, V Brown Bag Latam. This is Ariel Sanchez. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ariel. My apologies. No worries. Thanks, everybody.